I think of the Libertines as being me, Kyle, Gary and John, and that being the ultimate combination of magic, then I'm fucked, you know. For me, I can only think of it as one of the very few opportunities I've had in my life to pretty much perfectly express myself. People say put aside your differences. Our differences are a relationship. I can't really put that aside. I, you know, I miss him bitterly, but such is the nature of both of our relationships. I can't, I can't choose when I'm going to get Peter I need. People might say, is there another record in the old thing? Well, that's you normal. Know, we that's normal. That. We want that. We just roughly want to stick on the subject. As long as they're happy, we're happy. Yeah. They're looking a bit like, you know, we don't want to lose any moves. What we've said to, the, to all members of the band is that if they want to do things individually afterwards, then they're free to do it. Okay. If they don't want to, then they're happy. He's <laughs> an immature way of showing his love, I thought. Or maybe he just doesn't like my love. <laughs> there it is again! Wow, look at that! down there with his hand up. Do you want to stand up maybe and give us a loud question? Melvin Ben said there'd been a lot of hard work to get you all back into the same room together. It's a fucking nightmare. He lives in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> he never answered his phone. Tell me which one you know. Get on a stage and say, we're the Libertines. And it'd be real. And we mean it. With two crooked fingers. Heart-rending. We've always communicated with each other successfully through music. That's how and why we're together. And sorry. Oh. Cheers. 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 You don't know who you're looking at. Now just you look at me. I'm a bit of a knob, I am belong to royalty. I'll tell you how we got about, I married Widow Birch. I was king of England when we trotted out to church. Outside the people started shouting in foray. Said I go down upon your knees, it's coronation day. I'm in a easy ace, I am. In a easy ace, I am, I am. I got married to the widow next door. She'd been married seven times before. Everyone was a Henry. She wouldn't ever win the order, Sam. I'm a race old man named Henry. Henry the ace I am. It was nerve-wracking, but then... I knew that what we had to do was easy, because what we had to do was ingrained in my body, and this is what we'd done so much before, what I was meant to do. It was, it was all there, I was excited. It's called the uh, Smithies. It's the next street up from uh, Field Street. I missed the boys, I missed all the boys, really. You know? I missed Pete dearly, and I'm, I, mean, I look forward to, to that relationship, which can only exist. With us in that situation. If we don't do the four of us pace ourselves throughout these gigs, yeah, yeah then it's, 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 it's going to be mental. Like and last night, well, last night we could fucking let loose. Yeah, I hadn't actually so seen the guys in the band for quite a few years, probably two, three years, let alone played music with them. Uh, if you're right, Nick, out. <laughs> 
Yeah, everything's cool. Looking a little bit rough there, Gary. Just feeling a little tired. Yeah. <laughs> I was happier to see Pete, Carl and Jan, just to see them, than I was at that point in time to be considering performing shows. I bought them four quid each. He's always been good with numbers. Your first stop was the bucket shop to pick the pieces of your life up and scream looking glass at all that you despise. You're thinking back to the chicken shack and the smashing of the glass and the knife in the back. Well, my boy, who will believe your lies? All your lies. No one's going to sell you when the alibi. It was an immense occasion, man. Carl bought a round of drinks. <laughs> Listen, I've told you once, I've told you. Say it to me. Sorry, I can't hear anything. No, it's me. Who, who is it? Me. Oh, cool one. I knew you the cool one. So we both get equally nervous when we, when we see each other after a long period of time. Pete will normally say something that's vaguely humorous, but usually just disguising some kind of barbed nastiness. I guess I'll try and say something that dampens it, but then I can't help myself but reciprocate a little bit as well. And then as soon as we manage to sort of temper the defensive nastiness out of it, then... Yeah, I guess we're back. That's a funny relationship, what can I say? Hmm. We first met when I was at Brunel. Um, I didn't do a great deal of study, and I was best friends with his sister, Amy Jo. She had this brother who uh, had a bit of a face back home in this small town. This sort of uh, aspiring poet, he wanted to learn guitar. I didn't really know anyone that was actually any good at a guitar. Everyone just grew their hair like Liam Gallagher and started bands, but no one could actually like, do anything that was like, Particularly interesting, and then when I met Carl, he was actually like gifted on the guitars. I literally used to sit at his feet, and you know, I was hungry for knowledge. I wanted to know how he did, it, how he did that, and how he did this. The dog have got a special gift for um, painting people in a very beautiful, but slightly not romanticised and exaggerated light. Pete summed me up as a self-educated working class from the estates, which you know each bit true in its own way, but you know, not, not many people would really sort of uh, string those things together and you know, use that to represent the person. So I found that quite charming. He'd asked if I could learn the guitar part for uh, this charming man and the teaching when he came up to visit. And I didn't know anything about Smith, so naturally I went and worked out Charmless Man by Blur. Hi, man. I started going, I met him in a crowded room. <laughs> God, this bloke hasn't even heard the Smiths. And he hadn't heard the Smiths, and he hadn't heard the Suede, and it, and then, but even that really are quite, quite attractive to him as well, because he was just this, like, who is he? What I was nervous about was actually, was playing the songs wrong, because Pete was actually the taskmaster in the band, you know, he was like the Miles Davis char character, who, or James Brown, whoever it is, who got angry about that sort of thing. He wasn't happy about bum notes. Take a while. Okay, go on. <laughs> 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 I've been following, following your minds and stuff. 
production. Four eight nine Holloway Road. Yeah, it used to be a brothel that we used to live in. I cleaned it up a bit. To me, it would always be a hotbed of iniquity. People used to come and they used to phone up that phone box over there, and, 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 and then they could look out the window to make sure they were safe. And then uh, when they come over, and me and Pete used to have to sit in the uh, to sit in the bedroom and talk really gruff and loud. Like, oh, you're a fact, you're right, you're right. And we used to have this. Uh, Pathetic sort of pop gun. Yeah, if it ever came to it, we'd get out and. But uh, never came to it. There you go. I used to sleep in a, in a little bedroom at the top, in the middle window. Uh, I used to sleep in a big black iron cage. Which is... Things did get better. Uh, yeah, it's funny because we're so totally surrounded by everything to do with the music industry. Didn't know anything about it. Apparently, like. We're, we're, we're like enemy journalists downstairs and a photographer and a metropolis next door. But we, but I don't know what any of that meant, really. All we knew about was the comings and goings of uh, the brothel trade. It was always a certain thing would happen that would change everything, right? I spent so many years behind barbed wire and, and you know, literally regimented. That when I'd you know, get a fleeting chance to, to experience uh, just, just liberty, just being able to be myself and go where I wanted, when I wanted, it was. I think I just stood up one day in class and walked out of class and just, I just kept walking. My whole life was a sort of romantic tapestry in the basements of the Albion rooms. Um, just us and a little sort of island of bohemian dreams. We dug deeper in the end and we just found this, this other London of uh, vice and dope dens and parks and tramps and... We both were really desperate to get out of, you know, the England, that, the only England we'd ever, we'd ever been presented with, you know. We'd always fall out quite a lot. It was usually sort of bickery stuff. You know, I've always been quite cantankerous. It reached fever pitch when he was um, drinking a, a massive bottle of mineral water. At the time, I found that very poncy that he was like mineral water. But his, you know, his parents had brought it from Germany. And it, but he, was, but he was drinking it, slagging me off, sort of like leaning against a cooker. And I remember I kicked it out of his mouth. And that's when he got really angry and, and, and upset. And, and then he phoned, he phoned the police. And then the police came round and they said, all right, well, what's going on here? And then we were like, well, I'm not talking. And then they were like, well, I'm not talking to you either. And then they went, so, so what do you do? And I went, I'm an actor. And then they went to Peter, what do you do? He went, I'm a poet. <laughs> I don't believe the dreams, and why not? You know, I mean, there it is. all sort of stereotypes and cliches come from a kind of reality, which I think we were looking to sort of source, yeah. and they'll come true. I'll get that from selected petrol station. So, is it for the forum, you use it at the forum. Sure. Oh, thanks, man. I remember like, when we first played songs together, I think we were at Mortlake train station, and uh, the first time I'd ever really played him, I think I played in this song I've written, which later became a song called The Domestic. Yeah, my original lyrics were, John Lennon came down to me today, which was fucking laughable, really, in hindsight. And, uh, you know, Pete very tactfully, you know, just pre presented, presented something else. Things that he was reading about in books and dipping his toe into the water, but not really expressing himself. Just 
It sounds a bit daft, but just, you know, poetry and, and poetry being an expression of the soul and and it not just being on the page, you know, as you're living your life, but like following your dream. I learned a lot from Pete about lyrics and songwriting and whatnot along the way, you know, as, as he did with me and uh, playing the guitar, I suppose. I don't think I'll ever have a songwriting partner as special as Peter. And I don't think I'll ever have that chemistry again. You don't, don't think you find that twice in a lifetime. <laughs> When a strong idea comes out of him in one go, I'm normally left just by adding literally one line. Like even like France or Nazis and things like that, I just literally add a line or play a, lead, play a bit of guitar part. And you just pick up the guitar and... And it just comes out like that. Can I have a salt beef uh, and a cup of tea, please? Yeah. Show your hand, mate. Oh, no, always. Work. Thanks, mate. The early stuff, but I love your solo. Oh, cheers, too. man. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Can we have also? Can we have a uh, egg mayonnaise? Someone serving you. Uh, so yeah, yeah, but I, 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 there's more stuff to add. No, it's someone serving you. Someone did take my order. Yeah. I'll stay with them, darling. Thank you all for life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there it is, in all its glory. There's a funny thing about this whole area, I mean, not so much Brick Lane, but Shoreditch itself. I mean, it was rough as arse back in the day, and I think about artists come out and they find the such skanky area and the community develops, and I guess, and I guess that's how Shoreditch started. I think at the very heart of that was the foundry. Me and Pete used to have a night there called Arcadia at the Foundry. And it used to be just like random artists, but like proper artists used to like have little happenings. And like, they used to like let off dynamite and stuff in the old bank vault downstairs. And just like drink absinthe and all that lark. Like. I, I used to play the piano for the, while the poetry was going on, but literally like this. It was all, you know, it's kind of video as a black. We used to get free Guinness. And then, and then it got commercial and became what it is now. It's just that like unrecognisable now. They've, they've evicted the people who sell the foundry. So like, they've, they've basically cut out their own heart. But it's just so typical. I mean, like, responsible for this whole area and everything that happened. Yeah, and it's so unceremoniously just got uh, surgically removed. And that's a shame. There was kind of days when people didn't show up to the rehearsals. It was slightly kind of disconcerting, you know, that's just the way it goes. The idea girl in London from France came over what time did you get there? Uh, two? And then, uh, and then we found at half past four that he was asleep. So, um, so, so well, shit, really. The first like resurgence of you know my paranoid like hopeless state, which normally comes after four days up when I can't get to the rehearsal, you know. And back in the day, that would have been like that would just gone on without me. But now it was different. It was like, oh, you can't make the rehearsal. Don't worry, we'll see you tomorrow. I can't tell you what, what kind of relief that was, you know? It's quite simple, though. Pete doesn't sleep, then Pete doesn't turn up. Or if he goes to bed, then all of these things which dogged our past in the last ten years, all of these emotions and things that make people run off stage and things that make us think we're second-guessing each other, I learned that that goes away when you go to sleep. It's taken us a long time to realise why people go to bed.
We used to drink in Camden, the uh, Dublin Castle and the mix. So there was a guy down there um, called Scarborough Steve. And he said, uh, John, you got to meet these guys called Pete and Carl. I'm in a band with them. This was a very tall guy in the garden stroking my cat. And it was Pete. And he introduced himself. And, and then later, Carl came down and we were just jamming with the guitars. I think that's kind of what sold it to them, is that Scarborough Steve had told them that I had a lot of guitars. I just wanted to play bass in a band. Um, and these guys had some great songs, uh, really good songs. Normally, when I join a band, you know, you could sort of vacillate for months on end before you do anything. A couple of days after I met them, we played our first gig in a basement. And then Pete was like, okay, we're going to be called. And I was like, wow, okay. You put your love upon me, though I was before. Bani Pucci was our, uh, she was our first manager. I mean, uh, our first serious manager. She's the one who managed the Libertines in the old days when we'd play around little pubs and clubs and lug our amps on the one, three, four. When Banny found us, we were these romantic, troubadour-esque, living totally hand-to-mouth What We were living in adventure, with a firm belief that with our passion and pretty melodies and song and conviction, then we'd be able to conquer and do what we did for our people. After a while, things just uh, started to fall apart. Pete was always very flighty, and I was kind of flighty with him, really. The drummer and the bass player eventually just got sick of, you know, they'd found a gig, we didn't come, we found a gig, we said, be there now. And, and then we sort of split up, and, and Pete and I, obviously, what was the point of us splitting up? Then we realised that we weren't going to get by just singing sweet lullabies and meadows. We did have a lot of all the anger and everything, you know, that's like... Personally, I tried to sort of hide that from the music we did. I just guess we realised that let's open the floodgates and say it how it is, really. Now, in the beginning, Pete and Carl, they pulled me in really, really quickly. Those guys, I think, had gotten to a point where it was like, yeah, we need to really, really do this if we're going to do this at all. and. If we are going to do this with me, Gary, then he needs to be involved as much as possible. I kept on like just overemphasizing the point: we need to get a bass player. We need to get a bass player. And I can't remember one of them. Either one of them said, "Well, we could get John Dill bass player." And I said, "Just do it." Barney, she kind of made it clear that you know there was kind of. It was a different band in many respects. That was the first kind of debut, really, as a new band.
Let's just write a new list. Honestly, John, for like the most zen member of the band, he's the last time I scraps. Evidently not, me. Mr. Lombard. Gary Halfjob Powell. Got paper, but no pen. Got penis, but no balls. So, start off with the horror show. So, the horror show. Death on the stairs. Horror show, yeah, it's kind of, i say it's 90%. Let's get Death on the stairs. Okay, don't look back. Don't look back, we haven't done that. Did it once. So, no. I don't know back. We'll make your mind up, John. John, we've put the word. Why are you setting the stats down? I've got no idea because we play them once or twice. We could play them again you once after this. There's no point in genius. There's no point. And then we could play them again afterwards and it might be you really. Make your mind really up. Shit. What do you want to do? You want, just, what, just, just, right just take down. it reverse to stuff. Relax. What did you want to do? Before, do you like, well, why, why make it this? Just play stuff. Try new stuff. But now, we're saying that we can't do this stuff. We're doing that again. I don't understand your actions. Well, I just, just didn't seem very interesting. No one got it right, no one got it wrong. But it all did happen pretty quickly. James Endicott was the guy that we wanted to, to pin down for a while, you know. And, you know, I was waiting for him to return our calls and phone the band, he said, any news. Because it really was, I mean, we, really, we really just did want to get signed to Rough Trade. That was like, that was, that was what we called Plan A. Plan B was to sign to this little label called High Society, which was like a Hoxton sort of label. I don't think it had any bands in it, apart from the White Sport, maybe. And Pete was really wanting to go with Plan B. And we set up this whole elaborate gig at the Rhythm Factory, which is a dance venue got everyone we could together and sort of forced the scene really, which um, I mean, it took. And so it became as real as any, other, as any scene does. Bally was very sweet uh, about things in a, in a memorable way. I remember she got, uh, when we first got James Endicott to come and listen to the studio, she, she, she picked him up in a taxi and she had beer and crisps on the back seat as if this was like an industry standard thing to do, which I think might, might have perplexed him a little bit, but you know, that got his guard down and then uh, all worked out. Then he came down to the studio to see us doing demos. And uh, I think he thought we had some coke, but it was just mean, mean speed. And he went home, and, uh, he, and that night, I think he, he, he had an epiphany whilst he was lying next to his wife, sweating and wriggling around. And uh, th th I think he went sleepless into the office the next day and said, guys, you've got to listen to this. I wanted something. And then it started rolling from there, really. <laughs> feeling like trying to enjoy playing the music at the same time as trying to worry about what it was sounding like. Yeah. Trying to work out the riff to campaign of hate, I was really annoying myself. And then suddenly I felt really embarrassed in front of everyone, like, thinking, what the fuck am I doing? And then John was kind of hinting at the fact that, well, maybe Carl should play the riff, and that really threw me. Oh. So I'll, do, I'll do Pete's part then. Yeah, yeah, I'll do Pete's part. Oh, what was it? I'll do Pete's part. You go, Mama. 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 I'm about to do it when I start playing, John, I promise you. All right, just so for I'll you. Do, okay, just for you. Let's start that 
Oh yeah, oh shit, I missed out that bit, isn't it? Yeah. Then you go like this. It's quite important here. And then it goes. Oh. No, no, it doesn't do that. It goes instead of doing that when it goes to the G, it goes. And then it goes. Is that Ben? Yeah, on the uh, sixth fret. And then it goes up bend on the tenth fret. A bend on the tenth fret. Yeah. Yeah. And then it goes back to the campaign. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So just go from the. Go, go, go from just the go from the top then. What? Yeah. I've not, right. I've not worked this hard since you started rehearsals. Right. <laughs> Where's that? Got One, two, three, four. Even Teasdale Street's gone up in the world. They knocked down all these flats that were here and they built them. And those kids, they were babies. I think we lived in one of these ones. Oh, there she blows. <laughs> Oh my god, that's my old stairs. Oh. Don't, 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 don't let someone in there. We're not. I, I remember when Pete first said, like, I found this place. And I, I thought, oh, that's great. We went upstairs and there was like one big room with a, with a, with a big brass bed. I was like, oh, whose bedroom is this going to be then? And then, I, you know, I kind of like my privacy. You know, there was a little cupboard and that was my bedroom. Um, but, you know, I had a door and that's kind of... Uh, that's all they needed, really. Pete got in trouble and, like, after I left and everything got impounded and locked up and because the place was fucked. It's just been burned out. It was, it was disgraceful. The last time I was here, the, the toilet didn't work. You had to flush it with Evian. Yeah, there was no water. It was just shit everywhere. And, uh, it's those people I didn't know. It's very, very strange having a house and full of people you don't know. When we, we had uh, our secret gigs here, God knows how we all found it. But. She's got the double of the house. The double bite. <laughs> Candle silly. Hey, smash it. Stop it, John. No. John, John stop, stop it. it. Stop John. it. John, stop it. John. So that makes you. John! <laughs> John! <laughs> Have you got most A levels? Huh? Yeah. yeah. Give it to the master. Yeah, come on, A level boy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey! That's how you get your power, boys. I did, I did all the work on that. Hang on, that better not be in my fucking tea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Not only did they bring something out, something out of the music with their own, with their own style of performance, but they brought something out with, within themselves that made people want to gravitate to them, as I gravitated towards them in the beginning. It's like in the middle of the riot, I think I'd just been clonked with a truncheon while Pete was doing his hair in one of the guards' uh, shields. Yeah, and then, you know, then suddenly it was like midday, we had this appointment down the dive bar in Soho in Chinatown underneath the old king's head. And we went down there for our first proper interview. I think, I think, I think, I think that, that might have set the scene for us in a lot of ways. When you're being represented by a media, you, you learn pretty quickly that what you want to portray is nine times out of 10, not what's gonna come across. But in the first enemy feature we did for that cover, it seemed like everything that I'd have wanted, noted, was uh, without, you know, without making it obvious, was, was, was put down. We were running on a very, very tight budget. We had one tour manager who was a sound engineer who loaded in, who loaded out. In order for that person to do the job as succinctly as they possibly could do, they were running towards a schedule. Pete and Carl were just like, I don't give a damn about your schedule. I'm staying up all night long and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Without Pete and Carl being the charming guys that they were at that point in time, it would have been much harder for them to gain the notoriety as quickly as they did. I was always on the make in some way. I don't know what it was, but we were fame hungry, definitely. That's what we wanted, and that just that drove us. It's kind of the accepting things on the strength of notoriety. I guess it's like. Being the owner of a vaguely famous face is kind of does have its moments, I suppose. Was I the most famous in the Liberties? Yeah. I think, well, I was definitely the most, I became the most warped by the lack of power we ended up having when we got, you know, catapulted into, into public consciousness. I just wasn't able. Yeah, it was a mess, really, when it came to fame. There was a funny switch in the Albion rooms when I used to get really wrecked and I used to want to go out every night. I just, I just loved to drink. And, you know, we just discovered Charlie and we just had a load of money, so we got an sort of endless source of that and I'd go out and... I'd go and find all the sort of movers and shakers, for want of a better word. That's funny. I remember one night I brought the Cooper Temple course home. I wanted to show off you know, what we had, and I was proud of Pete. I love Pete. I wanted, I wanted to show, him, I wanted to show him off as well. And uh, and I got, and he was, he was really annoyed. I brought people back. He said, you know, what, we should just be at home writing songs. But I kind of felt I betrayed him a bit. Pete was kind of frustrated that not enough people were kind of really taking responsibility for the band. And he was out on his own, really, in many respects. And I think it's frustrating for him. And I think he probably felt kind of isolated by that. It wasn't long after that that then the drug thing started to really hit. I mean, the, I mean, the, 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 the smack and the crack thing and that way of life. And sort of, you know, there's very little to romanticise about those drugs for me. But, you know, I guess there is something. And he started to take that path. And I just kind of thought, well, we shouldn't be here writing songs without all these fucking ghoulish people, like, you know. It's, it always felt like a sort of rent an audience. People just find different things. And, you know, addictions are ways of life, aren't they? You know, it takes years before you realise there are addictions, if you ever do, if indeed they are. But, you know, not only did I not want to do those things, and 
I just um, didn't like him. I tried. I, I tried. I tried. I tried to do it to be closer to Peter on numerous occasions. You know, I always said that to him all along about everything, even about drugs. I said, all you have to do is say, you know, pack it in, and I would. He never actually bothered to say that. He just didn't talk to me. And I think he found a new love and a, a new light and a new adventure in, in that life and those people. And, and he was probably very heartbroken that I didn't want to join him. I said even then, I never made any secret of it, you know, especially with heroin. It's not an adventure, it's not exciting, because it's a, it's a story that's already been written a thousand times. It's fucking boring. It's like, it's got two endings. One is a, a, lifetime, a lifelong dull as fuck battle. Where you where where you where you're going to end up the shell of a man, and the other one is just a really shit untimely selfish death. And that's a, you know, that's a pretty hard thing to point out, you know, when when you, especially when you're on your off your face on coke, if not, you know, <laughs> it doesn't help. But yeah. Just like she's in another world, you know the suited child in my home. She never gave me clothes. We'd made everything just perfect. Everything just was in my mind, you know. We were rolling, and he he just wanted to sack John and Gary before a gig, and it just made no sense, really. I never wanted to be fired, but if it was going to happen, when I, I kind of knew why, I kind of figured that out. And there wasn't any point in me getting pissed off, because that was the bed that I put myself into. I don't feel like I was kind of blameless for, for what happened, you know. There was, there was always that kind of division between, you know, in a way between the four of us. And obviously it didn't feel very good. Time moves on. I mean, we, you know, there, there was a reason that that happened at the point in time. Whereas now, obviously, you know, we've moved on. Hello. Operator. Well, no, I thought we were going to put um, those three tickets. So the skippery ones together. Also, we're going to have two completely different sets, aren't we, for the forum and for the festivals? Not necessarily. Well, yeah, necessarily. It's the forum. There's no curfew. There's no. There's no set amount of time we can play as Yeah, but it's a warm up for the festival, isn't it? So no, it's not. It's not a warm up for the festival. Yeah, yeah. What's everyone could do? You'd write them out, all the songs, yeah. pick all the songs that we're doing, write them out and put them on the floor, yeah. and jumble them about. You get two the same, then you get another go. Like Tazos. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you get like whatever song sounds most similar. Yeah, it counts as a double. Mm -hmm. Like, there you go, it sounds quite similar to Irish. Yeah, so which one did you miss out? Um, it was a bracket. fucking waste of time, isn't it? No, it was not. I, I, oh, I, no, think, no, I think we should, still, we should keep, them, no, keep them both. No, no, it might, no, not, no, it might not work. <laughs> Cobain, Morrison, are you saying that Joplin, are you saying they weren't cool? How far can you turn up, yeah. you got, mate? Uh, just, just drop it off on the way at Patchell. You know, like, Libertines is like a big powder keg with a very short fuse. It's all a bit fraught and manic. It was a pig man who once said, the, the blood from broken hearts writes the word to every song. And uh, yeah, that's the trouble, isn't it? It's just not that easy. Otherwise, we just do loads of them. 
I remember it was my birthday and Pete had a gig at Gun to Grave or something. And, and, I, I, said, and I said I'd go. And, and, but, but, but my friends had arranged me fucking karaoke in Soho. But Pete just wouldn't understand. He was on his own manic path. That was all the crack and the smack and the, and the drongos that hung around it. And, and it was becoming something different. That's when, the, that's when it started becoming all these different factions, different camps, and it started getting a bit grotesque. And, it, and, that, and that, that was the first occasion when I just said, Do you know what, I'm not going. Arcadia for me isn't pissing all over someone else's fucking dreams and will. It's about something that's shared, about something that's beautiful. And, you know, for whatever reason, I don't think Pete was uh, coming from a place that served Albion in the, the Arcadian dream. Yeah, it was very hard, and I had, to, I had to find some reserves of bravery to to be able to get my own way. They booted me out of the band and carried on without me. Yeah, I don't understand how, in the first place, I knew it kicked out my own band. I don't understand how that worked. I don't understand how, what, what the fuck. When Peter was going crazy and constantly and everyone was worried, and of course it was so difficult to hold together, when people finally looked to me and said, well, what about you? This is actually tearing you apart and breaking your heart. And when people said that, I was relieved and I felt comforted, but I felt so alone out there. And, uh, but I don't, maybe I wouldn't have done it without the strength of other people giving me some support. Yeah, man, I was distraught. I tried to carve out, I got that liberty, and it doesn't look so bad, and I tried to carve out you know, that little scar there that opened right up so you couldn't actually see anything but the L and the E. But that was when I just literally turned on the telly, and they were doing, like, don't look back into the sound on top of the pops. What a fucking hell. Retrospectively, I wouldn't have done anything differently because I always acted as true to who I was. And, you know, I was just thinking, is that a defence mechanism? No, I don't think it is. I wouldn't change anything. That's a journey. That's what, that's what was supposed to happen. No, you just have the jeans downstairs, mate. Uh, I took her back. There were some jeans in there. Blue jeans. And so I don't worry, it's my belt's in there. Right, we better get going. I just looked on the staircase. You what? I looked on the staircase. Well, ah. can you do some guest disfavours? Yep. Can you make sure my sister's got a plus four? Lucy? Yeah. For tonight, yeah? Yeah. How are you doing? Good, good. I was just checking your names for tonight, actually. Loz. Butty, Hussy, L, L, L O Z, Hussy, Samira, and Am S Samira, mm -hmm. <laughs> Cherry. Are you reading out your little black book? <laughs> okay, I just wanted to know if you want to come and see the Libertines tonight. Kentish Town Forum. <laughs> Kentish Town Forum. I'll send you a text right away. Uh, okay, wicked. All right, cheers. See ya. Take a seat. Bye, bye. Who's that? My doctor. Hi, Kelly. Yeah, not bad. How are you going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just doing a panic guest list check now because I've, I've, I've neglected to do that. But uh, I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow, right? Okay. See you. Cheers. Bye. Right. Have I been rehearsing a lot? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have that chat right now. Oh, it's a bit nerve-wracking. All this.
Good to see you. Good. How are you? Yeah, well, yeah. There was so little preparation going into it, I had to work even harder to make sure that I was really mentally prepared. I closed myself down and I think about the music. And then I put myself in the zone of, of being in the band with the guys. We do, in many ways, complete each other, which is, uh, you can't say about a lot of, a lot of people. I mean, you know, it comes at a price, but when it happens, it's just purer than anything else. When we got up on stage, you know, just to rehearse, it was, um, it was like nothing else. It, it was like we hadn't dropped a beat. People always say, do you get nerves? And I say, no, I don't get nerves. It's I felt really lucky that I was going, just going to play my guitar and play these songs with Carl and John and Gary. I felt really blessed, I felt really lucky. One of the really great things about doing these concerts was that actually it was kind of an opportunity to revisit the band and kind of try and create something with a better ending for it.
honest with you, I didn't think they'd do it, and they fucking blew my mind. The validity of tonight was orgasmic, it was seismic, it was cataclysmic. It was just like fucking a spark in your eye, a fucking grind in the teeth, and a fucking spit, and a fucking come on. It was like that, come on. It's almost like libertines with the sort of mud parts. How about that then, eh? This is a bit of a little libertines alley. I mean, you know, it's not Abbey Road, but yeah, that's a grumble. <laughs> this is pretty fucking far out, I've got to say. <laughs> what does that say? What became of forever? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. I wasn't expecting this, though, that's for sure. It's kind of beautiful, really. Um, I might, might die a bit happier. Not, 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 I might have to kill Tone first. There you go, eh? Yeah, this, is this is fucking mental. There you go, it was 112, eh? I told you. That, it, it has kind of looked beside me, it's a bit of silly, it's like. Uh, yeah, man. It, this reminds me that it means a lot to a lot of people. How do you go forth to all of that?
I knew a simple soldier boy who grinned through life in empty joy, slept soundly through the lonesome dark, and whistled early with the lark. From winter trenches, cowed and glum, the crumps and lice and lack of rum, he put a bullet through his brain, and no one spoke of him again. You smug-faced crowds with kindling eye who cheer when soldier boys march by. Sneak home and pray you'll never know the hell where youth and laughter go. Now that was more for knowing in secret to soon, but hey, just to bring that back and have it on a wall in East London, is, um, that's quite moving. And fuck them, of course. It was almost like a big industry con, the whole thing, it was like, right, getting back together and everyone's happy, like, fucking tour bus coming, you can have, like, four tour buses and one for the crew, that's five, five tour buses, someone's made them in there, don't know who did the merchandise, but someone made them in there, who was the agent, I don't know who that was, didn't need them, didn't have to advertise the fucking gigs, they could have sold out anyway, I could have sold out those gigs myself with a mobile phone. It means back, I can, everyone's going to do well out of it. Carl cares deeply, really, about what we achieved, and and I think he really believes he, he, he cares. He cares a lot about me, but you know, it takes this this huge mechanism to kick in before there's any like talking in the pub or rehearsing or communication. You know. Possible to hang out with Pete. Pete's a Pied Piper, you know. He can be entertaining and, and wonderful and beautiful and inspiring, uh, and take people with him. If our journey's together, then we need, to, we need to go together. We need to be side by side. Just the exhaustion of the not knowing of the unpredictability. As much as I do love it, and as much as it makes me feel alive, I just wish it could be easier. <laughs> It's not like that with most of the people I've been in bands with. With Carl it is. And, you know, I don't know why. He doesn't trust me. And he hasn't trusted me for a long time. And as far as I can tell, it's just, it's too late to do anything about it. I, I opted out of dying at 27 uh, for a reason, really. 
I think not to accept that, it's just going to cause disaster.
We're in a period of time right now where music is disposable. There's no way we can rely on playing begging forever. It just won't wash. People will get really, really bored of it. And then that will be the end of the name Liberties. But we have to look at who we are, look at where we came from in order to figure out exactly where we're going. I don't feel like a kind of a jilted lover, the fact that he doesn't want to spend time with me writing songs, because he never did. I'd be very conscious of wanting to give him something that he'd be inspired by or, or want to contribute to, you know? It's almost like I've never written a song with him before, to be honest, you know, the person he's now. I think a lot of it really just boils down to Carl. Me and Gary and John are quite pliable, quite easily manipulated, like, you know, and we're up for, I think we're pretty much up for doing anything any time as the Liberty is now. It's really down to Carl. I'd like to write again, and I'd like to write fresh as well. I don't, I don't want to be playing old things and rehashing things. I don't think that, um, I don't feel like, I don't think I'd feel complete as a person to, not at least attempt to make another record with Peter. But the time has to be right, you know, like it was right for these gigs, like I have to know and it has to feel right. Yeah, I'd love to do that. It hurts me that I just can't do it, that it's just not that easy. Right, cheers, everyone. The Libertines reunion for me was a chance to be back with heroes. They pulled something out of me and changed who I am as an individual in the same breath. I think the greatest achievement was that we managed to overcome our differences for these shows and that we can be friends again after all this shit. I think that's a great achievement. business was, in a way, obviously, I'm not being overly optimistic about all the where I'm talking now, but I think really I'm underplaying like, how important it was to me, like those gigs, and how amazing it was, because it was. I mean, it doesn't really matter what anyone else thinks, because I can see who's genuinely enjoying it. It was really important for me to feel like, that he could just be happy to be in a band with me. You know? stage at that moment it's so hard to find and so hard to reach it just comes out and eclipses everything and just spreads and that's the happiness that I had in the Libertines nothing like it it's pure as a driven snow and rare Say you love 
do something different though. 